to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in first corinthians 5 verse 7 the bible says for christ our passover was sacrificed for us as you think about the old testament passover and the events of that day and then as we look forward to christ there are so many powerful lessons that we can learn from christ the new Passover lamb. We welcome you to our study of Old Testament lessons that we're going to look at today, especially revolving around the Passover of the Old Testament and how that looks forward to Christ. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We'd love to invite you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. There are people there who love God, love His Word, and are concerned about lost souls, and we encourage you to stop by and see the church in your area. If you got like to study the Bible, learn more about worship or the church, friend, they'd be happy to sit down and open up the Word of God with you and look and see what the Scriptures say on those matters. The Gospel of Christ, we also want to encourage you to visit our website where you can find a good variety of Bible study materials. We have free audio and video lessons that are available for download, or you can receive a hard copy of those on DVD or CD. Just visit our website. And there you can request a free media uh, from us. We'd be glad to send that to you. And again, if you've got things that you're studying that you'd like help with, then contact us by calling us or emailing us, writing to us, and we'll be helping you in any way that we can in your study of the Word of God. As we turn our attention to the Passover, the events leading up to the Passover in Exodus chapter 12 are very pertinent to the context. In Exodus 1 through 11, we now have that a new Pharaoh arises. A new dynasty of Pharaoh arises that does not know Joseph or the people of God. As a result, the people of the Egyptians, the Egyptian people, are growing uh, powerful. God's people are starting to grow in number though. And so the Egyptians realized this won't work. They began to put to death some of God's people. God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses is now going to release God's people from Egyptian bondage and tyranny. God uses nine of the ten plagues to help them see His power. The tenth plague, though, the final plague, is what will ultimately convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. The death of the firstborn causes Pharaoh's son to die, and as a result, he finally lets God, God's people go. But how did Israel escape that plague? They escaped it through the Passover, the lamb of the Passover's blood being put on the doorpost, and then they would ultimately, once they depart, separate that Passover where God allowed them to come out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb being posted in each one of their houses. Friend, as we think about the Old Testament, there are so many things in the Old Testament that were a type or a shadow of things in the New Testament. For example, you've got the, the congregation of Israel that followed Moses, and then you've got the church. God's people today that follow Christ. You've got baptism into Moses in the Red Sea. And then you've got baptism today. And then you have that original Passover lamb in Exodus 11 and 12. And you've got Christ, His death, who is our Passover lamb today. Today we want to think about the similarities between the Passover lamb of Israel and Jesus Christ, the true Passover lamb of God. And so when we think about these things, let's realize this about Jesus, our Passover lamb. Exodus 12 verses 3 and 4 says this, Speaking to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb 
according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without spot and blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. God's people to remember what happened in Exodus 11, in that final plague in Exodus 10 and 11, where they posted the blood of the lamb to their doorpost and the death angel passed over as it were. They're reminded when they take the Passover lamb of God passing over his people and passing over every family that did that. And so the lamb played a significant part in the Passover. Friend, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb today. Jesus, in fact, is identified as the true lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, For Christ, our Passover, the word Paschal there, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you redeemed not by corruptible things, like silver or gold from your aimless conduct handed down by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and blemish. John 1 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus approaching and he says this, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see that great scene in Revelation 5, verses 8 through 12, where there is a lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. And that lamb represents Jesus Christ. Friend, it's also very interesting to notice that Jesus was taken by lawless men during the Passover to become the true Passover of God. It was during the Old Testament Passover time that Jesus, lawless men took Jesus, John 19, 14, and He was made to be the true Passover Lamb of God. Now, when you think about Jesus as the Passover Lamb, let's also realize this. Just like the Old Testament Passover Lamb had some conditions it had to meet, Christ is the perfect Lamb of God today. Listen again to Exodus 12, verse 5. The Bible says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, there were certain characteristics of the Passover lamb that it had to meet so that it would be proper to give during that time. It couldn't have spot or blemish. It had to be perfect, had to be whole in that sense a male of the first year, and it could be of the sheep or of the goats. Now, Jesus perfectly fits the qualities and characteristics that were given for the Passover lamb. Jesus was of the right stock. That is, He was of the stock of Israel. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and Genesis 22, 18, said that the, the one who would bless all nations would ultimately be of the seed of Abraham. Jesus is of the seed of Abraham. John chapter 8, Jesus clearly identified before Abraham was, I am. Not only that though, Jesus is of the lineage of David. 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 through 14, there would be one from the seed of David who would reign over the house of Israel forever. Jesus, according to Luke 1 verse 32 and 33, is that one of the house of David reigning forever. But more importantly, Jesus is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 verse 14, He's of the right lineage and stock of Israel to be the proper Passover lamb. But you know, Jesus also has the perfect qualities and characteristics to be the Passover lamb. Remember, that Old Testament lamb couldn't be a cull lamb. It couldn't be a hurt lamb. couldn't be a sick lamb. It was to be without spot and blemish. Spiritually speaking, that represents the Lord Jesus Christ, who committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth. 1 Peter 1, verse 19 through 21. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf 
that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. He's done all things well. Mark chapter 7, verse 37, He was about the Father's business. Luke chapter 2, verse 49 through 52. And so, as you think about the, the comparisons, Jesus represents in such clear fashion that perfect, sinless, harmless Son of God, the Passover Lamb for us today. But as we think about comparisons with the Passover Lamb, realize this also. The Passover Lamb under the Old Testament was slain by Israel, by the people, by the congregation. Look in Exodus 12, verse 6. The Bible says this, Now you shall keep it, that is the Passover Lamb, until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. This Passover lamb, it was to be slain in front of and at the hands of the whole congregation of Israel. Friend, do we realize that Jesus typifies this in that our Lord was put to death at the hands of the Jews. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 and 15, the, the Jews are clearly identified, the nation of Israel is clearly identified as playing a part in that. Acts 2, verse 23, Peter said, Your lawless hands have taken him. Acts 5, verse 30, He was taken by the hands of the Israelites. And then, of course, John 19, 6, we clearly see He was put up before all Israel, taken by the hands of the Jews, who cried out uh, as they were asked, do you want me to release Barabbas or Jesus? They told him, release Barabbas. They wanted Jesus crucified. And so the Jewish nation, Jesus' blood is on their hands. But not only was Jesus crucified by the Jews, let's realize this as well. Let's make it personal. It was my sins and it was your sins that put Jesus on the cross. Oh, the Passover lamb, it was for the people of Israel. But as we think about how Jesus typifies that, how He was slain by Israel, friend, I've got to make it personal. Jesus was slain by my hands and by yours as well. It was done for the sins of the whole world. And I am a part of that world and so are you. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, Our sins separate us from God. Hebrews 10 verse 26 and Hebrews 9 verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And 2 Timothy 1 verses 9 through 10 tells us, Jesus, according to the plan of God, He died for my sins and for yours. Yes, Israel, their hands are the ones who literally took Him. But friend, my sin and your sin put Jesus on the cross, the Passover lamb, just as much as the Israelites did. Now, as we think about thinking about typifying and the example of Jesus as the true Passover lamb, let's realize what that Passover lamb represented. The Passover lamb, its blood, it allowed them to escape the punishment that was coming upon Egypt. Listen to Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now listen to this. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so this final plague, God is convincing Pharaoh He's destroying the heathen nations and their gods. And if there is no blood on the post of the door of that house, then they're going to lose the firstborn in that house. And yet God says to His people, listen to these beautiful words, When I see the blood, I'll pass over your houses. When God saw the blood on the doorpost of the house of Israel, that house wouldn't suffer that final plague of the death of the firstborn that was coming. Now, friend, let's think about the practical application of that today. Today, people can escape the wrath of God, the plague that's coming spiritually, by applying the blood of Christ to their spirits. Notice how powerful the blood of Jesus is for people today. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus' blood has the power to remit 
or remove all sin. As Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper with His disciples, He takes that fruit of the vine and He says this, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. The blood of Jesus remits or removes every sin a person's ever committed. The blood of Jesus is what bought the church or the saved in the first century and today. Acts 20 verse 28 as Paul speaks to the elders in Ephesus and as he encourages them to be shepherds, he says this in Acts 20 verse 28, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. What did the blood of Jesus do? It remits all sin. It's that payment, that price that bought the saved and collects them into that place. The blood of Jesus is what justifies sinners. Romans 5 verse 9, having been justified freely by his blood. The word justified is unique in that it means to be just as if I'd never sinned. What does it mean when you're justified by the blood of Jesus? Friend, you get a second start, a do-over. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. There it is, the do-over. All things have passed away. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. It's the blood of Christ that buys us back or redeems us to God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and Revelation 5, verse 9, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see, by selling myself to Satan, Satan now has me captive. What is it that's going to ransom us or buy us back from Satan? The blood of Jesus is what redeems or buys us back. It's that price that was paid for our sin. The blood of Christ is what allows us to enter the most holy place. Hebrews 9 verse 12, they couldn't enter the holy place except without blood, that blood that was sacrificed. Today, the Bible says in Hebrews 4 verse 16, Therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. We can enter the holy place of God today because of the great sacrifice that Jesus made. It is that blood that allows us to draw near. We draw near to God, Ephesians 2.13, by the blood of Jesus Christ. And friend, don't miss this. It is that blood of Christ as we walk in the light that continually cleanses us. If we walk in the light, listen to this now. If we walk in the light, that means trying to live the Christian life every day. If we walk in the light, as He, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses. That's durative, ongoing idea. Continually cleanses us of all sin. Can you see the power? The, the power in that Paschal, Passover lamb in the book of Exodus. You could clearly see that when that last plague passed over the house. You were thankful to God that the blood had been applied and you realized how powerful that blood was. Your firstborn didn't have to die. How much more so today when we think about the powerful benefits of our Lord and Savior's blood that is applied to every person's spirit. But friend, let's realize this also. As we think about the, uh, the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus, let's not miss the fact that then, as are today, there were some things they had to do to escape the judgment of God and obey Him. Listen to Exodus chapter 12, verse number 21 following. In Exodus chapter 12, here's what God commanded them. Verse number 21, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and shall strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Were there any acts of obedience? Were there any commands they had to follow for the blood to work, for the blood to be uh, applied to their houses? Well, sure there was. The Israelites could not escape the judgment of God unless they obeyed God and did certain things. First of all, 
they had to kill a lamb. You couldn't do it some other way. There was no other way except killing the lamb. As bad as it may have hurted, as much as you may not have wanted to, you had to kill a lamb. You had to gather some hyssop, something that would be sponge-like as it were, a rag or something we might think of, a hyssop. You had to gather hyssop. You had to take that and actually dip it in blood. Then you had to take that with blood on it and put it on the lintel, the top part, and on both of the posts. Then you could not go out of your house all night until the morning. Now, would you say those are things they absolutely had to do to be saved from that last plague? Sure. Did these acts earn the Israelites, their salvation? No. It was the blood being applied. It was God's grace, God's mercy, God's favor that passed over them. But friend, if they didn't do what God said, they don't obey Him, they wouldn't have been saved. You see, you've got both grace and faith combined there. Listen to Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They were saved by the grace of God, but that, does that mean they didn't have to do anything? God's grace and their faith, both were essential in them being saved from the judgment that was coming. Friend, how appropriate that is and how true that is to the blood of Christ being applied to people's spirits today. There are certain things God says one must do to obey Him and to be saved and to have the blood of Christ applied to our lives spiritually. The Bible teaches that you've got to hear the Word of God. In Romans 10, 17, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, I know I've got to have faith, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. How do I get faith? If faith is essential, whatever way I get faith is essential also, right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. Friend, if I'm going to be saved, I've got to study the Word. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, I've got to read it, I've got to seek it, I've got to search it, Acts 17, 11, I've got to prove it, all things to be true. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, Once I've heard the Word, if I'm going to be saved, I've got to believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, as they're traveling down the road, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, in the distance he sees it. Hey, Here's water. There's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Here's the condition. If you believe with all your heart, you may. Is belief a condition you have to meet to contact the blood of Jesus? Absolutely. Now, friend, it's not the only one, and it doesn't end there. But I've got to hear the message of Christ, and I've got to believe in Jesus. Friend, realize this also. To contact the blood of Jesus, Jesus says, I must repent. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. There's no other way around it. I've got to turn from sin and turn to God. Acts 3, 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again, or be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance is a change way of thinking that leads to a change way of acting. I'm no longer going to give myself to sin. I'm going to turn to God. doesn't mean you're 100% perfect. None of us are, but we're going to try every day to walk in the light. Then a person must be willing to confess Jesus as Lord in their life. Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've got to do what Jesus said. If you won't confess me before men, Neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And friend, listen real carefully. To contact the blood of Jesus that saves, the death and the blood of Jesus, one must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Revelation 1 verse 5 says, We're washed in His blood. Acts 22, 16, Saul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. But probably the clearest passage to help us see that I cannot contact the, the death and the blood of Jesus without being baptized is found in the book of Romans. I want to ask you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. And I want you to notice it is at the point of baptism that we contact the blood and the death of Jesus. Listen to Romans 6, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, What shall we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or, now notice this, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into, into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Question. Without the death of Jesus, is there any salvation? Of course not. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Jesus' death is absolutely essential to salvation. All right, second question. When do I contact the death of Jesus? As many of us as were baptized into His death have been buried with Him in baptism. Friend, you cannot contact the death of Jesus without being baptized. The blood was essential under the Old Testament Passover. They didn't put it to their lintel. They didn't put it on the deer po doorpost. They were, somebody in their house was going to die. Firstborn's going to die. Friend, if you don't apply the blood of Christ to, you, to yourself spiritually by obeying the gospel and ultimately being baptized, you cannot be saved. God wants you to be saved. He doesn't want men and women to be lost. The Bible says God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse number 4. Christians everywhere want men and women to be saved, but you can't be saved without the blood of the Passover lamb being applied to you spiritually. And to do that, you've got to hear the message. You've got to believe in Jesus. You must repent of sin. Confess His name before men. And, and as Peter so clearly said in 1 Peter 3 verse 21, baptism does now also save us. It's where we contact the blood of Jesus in salvation. Friend, has the blood of the New Testament Passover lamb been applied to your spirit? If not, then on the day of judgment, you do have something to fear. But if you've obeyed the gospel, you're a Christian, you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, on that great and final day, instead of hearing the words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you can hear these wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. May God help each of us to live in view of that hope each and every day of our lives. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.